And this is you, Utah Phillips, the golden voice of the great Southwest with Loafer's Glory, the hobo jungle of the mind, your PG-13 Rabbit Ears Radio. America by Walt Whitman. Center of equal daughters, equal sons. All, all alike, endeared, grown, ungrown, young or old. Strong, ample, fair, enduring, capable, rich. Perennial with the earth, with freedom, law, and love. A grand, sane, towering, seated mother. Phillips with you again uh, in the studios of radio station KVM, KVMR, Community Radio, Nevada City, California. I'm here with uh, Steve Baker, the engineer, since I don't know how to use those knobs and dials. You were just listening to Jimmy and Nancy Borsdorf playing the ever-popular Loafer's Glory. They very kindly put that theme together for us. And I'm still up here in Nevada City, California, my home, where truth rides hard and beauty ain't no camouflage. It's been rather cold in the mornings around here, a lot of frost, a lot of heavy ice on everybody's windshields. Uh, I saw the the volunteer fire department out yesterday morning uh, with hatchets chopping the dogs loose from the fire hydrants. Now, I... I don't know where you're listening to this. It could be in Scratching Post, Virginia. I just don't know where this goes. I I have no concept of it. Nonetheless, I have to live in Nevada City. So, see, the newspaper. Now, everybody in Nevada City knows what everybody else is doing. Read the newspaper to see who got caught at it. All right? And besides the paper, it's printed on really soft paper, which gives it a redeeming social value. They In the newspaper, they said last week just locally here, that I was going to play an 1890 recording of Walt Whitman reciting that poetry poem you just heard, America. Well, I didn't do it because it sounded so scratchy, I didn't think that anybody would understand it. But then my friends and neighbors got on me and said, boy, it was announced in the paper, so you damn well better play it. A promise made is a debt unpaid, and the trail is its own stern code. Robert W. Service, all right. Here's the poem, America, recorded by... Thomas Elva Edison in 1890 of Walt Whitman at the age of 71. America, center of equal daughters, equal sons, all, all alike and dear, grown, ungrown, young or old, strong, ample, fair, enduring, capable, rich, perennial with the earth, with freedom, law, and love. For some reason that cuts off the the last line of it. Maybe the cylinder just failed. Nonetheless, you were listening to the voice of Walt Whitman. Now, doesn't that raise an interesting question? Okay, all you legions of high school students who listen to this show out there, I got a proposition for you. That recording, and up into the the teens of this century, those recordings were made acoustically. There was no electricity involved. They were entirely mechanical. You sang into the same horn that the sound came out of. Now, I want an English class and a history class to get together and research the material base that was used to make that recording, and then find out to research whether that material base existed, say, during the Renaissance. If all that was missing was the idea. Well, if all that was missing was the idea, then it means that you could figure it out. You could, if it turns out to be true, that you could have actually heard uh, William Shakespeare recite his own poetry, you could have heard Leonardo da Vinci, you could have, uh, have heard Michelangelo, then you take that information, that material based down, and combine your, your, what you figured out with the shop class, and then you build one. All right? Does that sound like a worthwhile project? Damn, it does to me. Then some talk about 
And it comes up periodically about how much I do uh, that originates in the in the past, not the too deep past, but nonetheless the past. Uh, well, I, I'll tell you, it's like I have a friend, a good friend, a fine folk singer in the East, and he says, uh, you know, you can't live in the past, Utah. I, I always figured anybody who tells me I can't live in the past is trying to get me to forget something that if I remembered it would get him in serious trouble. Now I say to my singer friend, I can go outside and pick up a rock and bring it in here and drop it on your foot. That rock's older than the oldest song you know. Right on your foot. The past didn't go anywhere, did it? Did it? Well, to prove the point in this show, I'm going to do you some old music from the Depression. And then I want you to tell me if this is the past or if this is the present. I think I'll start out chortling by myself with an old Depression song by W.O. Blee called Boom Went the Boom. I can't figure out how to play this on the guitar, so I'll just uh, sing it. I had a job in 29 when everything was going fine and knew the pace was very fast, but thought that it would always last. When organizers came to town, I'd always sneer and turn them down. I thought the boss was my best friend. He'd stick by me until the end. ta ra ra boom de ain't got a word to say. He chiseled down my pay, then took my job away. Boom went the boom one day, it made a noise that way. I wish that I'd been wise, next time I'll organize. I had a little bank account, not very much a small amount, which to the savings bank I took, and all they gave me was a book. I pinched on food, I scraped on rent, I hardly ever spent a cent. My little savings grew and grew, I thought I'd be a big shot too. Ta ra ra boom de it made a noise that way. There went my hard earned pay, saved for a rainy day. I must have been a wick. This soup line makes me sick. Where can that banker be? He tore his pants with me. Then finally it came to pass that all I had to eat was grass. The wolf don't bother any more. He'd starve to death right by my door. With soup and gas and club and gun, they tried to make the system run. They said, dear friends, now don't get sore. We'll make it like it was before. Ta ra ra bum de it busted up one day. Those guys that stole my pay went flying every way. All that I've got to say, I hope they've gone to stay. Each dog must have its day. Ta ra ra bum de All right. That song that song was written in the nineteen thirties. Could it have been written yesterday? Uh pretty soon translations of that song will be available in Korean and Japanese and uh, Indonesian. Ah, you get the point? Well, the Depression. I was a late Depression child. Uh, oh, 1930, 1940 is my first awareness of it. Um, I remember there was very little food around the house. My mother said, uh, said to me, the worst licking I ever got, the worst licking I ever got was my mother said, eat every potato and pee on your plate. And I did. Boy. I can still feel the lash. Yes, sir, we were four of us around the table, and my father had come home. It was late. It was dark. There were, occasionally, there might be five pork chops for the four of us, so we'd all be eating our pork chop, looking at that one lone pork chop, aching for it, aching for it in the middle of the table. Aha, but I sat by the door where the light switch was, and as I got done with my pork chop, I reached up with my elbow and flicked that light switch off. Have you ever felt three forks in the back of your hand. <laughs> now, I want you to listen to this. See if you recognize it. Well, you'll recognize it, then I'll tell you a story about it. That's somewhere over the rainbow. All the... Words, all the lyrics to that were written by Yip Harburg. Yip Harburg wrote many, many great songs. He wrote the whole uh, book for uh, Finnegan's Rainbow. He uh, was a, a great, great uh, song maker and a great lyricist. Born on the Lower East Side of New York, son of Jewish immigrants in uh, about 1898. That's where Hammerstein came from. Um, about the same time, uh, uh, so it was an enormous talent pool that was looking for a way to burst out of the ghetto. Um, and make a decent living. Well, Yip Harburg certainly did that. Uh, somewhere over the rainbow. But 
It was during, it was in 1932. Harburg had a very progressive notion of how the world was put together. Uh, the Depression happened, and of course the president wanted happy days are here again, or prosperity is just around the corner, but no. Yep Harburg wrote this song for a show, and it was almost banished from the show. Jay Gorney wrote the, uh, wrote the, the music to it. Um, let, me, let me give you a... a let me give you a, a notion of how Yip Harburg felt about this song. Buddy, can you spare a dime? This is Yip Harburg speaking. What was wrong with our whole economic system? That the man who builds, the man who creates, is not always the man who gets the profit. He's always working for the man who sells him. So that bewildered person in the streets is now saying, I built the railroad, I built the tower, I went to war for this country, why are my hands empty? And I think what made that song popular and great and why it's lasting now is that it's still asking the universal question of why does the man who produces not share in the wealth? <laughs> I grew up when America had a dream and its people a hope. Whether we were struggling against the shackles of slavery or the shackles of scarcity, the hope was there. In 1930, the dream collapsed. The system fell apart. The people were... Not in revolt, this was a good country and on its way to greatness. It had given our immigrants more freedom, more education, more opportunity than it had ever known. What happened? We were baffled, bewildered, and the bewildered, baffled man sang. Jay was the fellow who saved me from the apple vending machine, apple vending push carton. He was the first man to say, I will put your lyrics to music. And this was probably one of the first of the songs that we wrote together. Don't you think we ought to change it to Buddy King and Spare a buck now? I mean, inflation. <laughs> building a dream and so I followed the mob when there was earth to plow or guns to bear I was always there right on a job they used to tell me I was building a dream with peace and glory ahead why should I be standing in line Just waiting for bread Once I built a railroad Made it run Made it race against time Once I built a railroad Now it's done Buddy, can you spare a dime? Once I built a tower to the sun, brick and rivet and lime. Once I built that tower, now it's done. Brother, can you spare a dime? Once in khaki suits, gee, we looked swell, full of that Yankee doodle dee dum. Half a million boots went slogging through hell. I was the kid with a drum. Say, don't you remember? They called me. It was Al all the time. Say, don't you remember? I'm your pal. Buddy, can you spare a dime? 
That was Yip Harburg singing his own song, Buddy, Can You Spare a Dime? Yip Harburg was 77 years old when he performed that concert that you just heard. It passed. Didn't go anywhere. Well, the songs were dealing with economic issues. Of course, the Almanac singers were had come to life in 1940 and 41 with Woody Guthrie and Bess Hawes and Pete Seeger and Lee Hayes, all of them. It was a great great time for making music about social change. It wasn't just about economic issues, it was about racism too. I know we kind of date the struggle against um, racial discrimination back to Rosa Parks and the uh, Montgomery bus boycott, but I was going a long, long, long before that, all the way back to Stephen A. Douglas. By the way, I just was, (sighs) this is a matter that concerns me. I was over in uh, San Mateo Uh, for the Martin Luther King uh, concert. And um, I was with Pete Seeger and and John Fromer, some wonderful people. And that morning, I I picked up the newspaper, and there was a little clipping in there about the Martin Luther King ceremony with Coretta Scott King there in Atlanta. And his I Have a Dream speech, they announced, was being read by a TV personality who stars in the show Homicide that immediately presented a contradiction. And I felt constrained to point out, and I hope I didn't get too tedious with the folks over there, that I'm really tired of Martin Luther King being built up only as a civil rights leader, only as a a man in pursuit of justice, and seeing his pacifism devalued, devalued. This man has been praised as virtues have been extolled by presidents who are responsible for bombing thousands of people. Now, come on, folks. Martin Luther King was a pacifist, and he didn't just accept pacifism as a tactic. Oh, use it here, but not there. No. It was a way of life. Martin Luther King understood that force is the weapon of the weak. Well, Harburg combined forces in 1944 with... uh, Earl Robinson, do you know that name? Earl Robinson is the one who wrote uh, the music for the Ballad of Joe Hill. He wrote the Ballad for Americans. You know how many people recorded that? Frank Sinatra, a whole lot of people. By 1951, it was banned. You couldn't hear it any place except my wife's high school. New Trier High School in, in uh, whatever, where I, Evanston, one of those towns north of Chicago. Anyway... All of this music was pretty much banned after, um, after you know, when the McCarthy era started. But Yip Harburg and Earl Robinson discovered that there toward the end of the war, if you were wounded or if you had an operation or needed transfusion, that you could demand that you only get white blood. Uh, that was appalling, an appalling idea that the Red Cross blood banks were segregated so they sat down together, Yip Harburg from Somewhere Over the Rainbow and Earl Robinson from The Ballad of Joe Hill. And uh, they wrote this song, but this song was first sung in 1944 on Nationwide Network, CBS, as a salute to FDR on Election Eve. And no less than three years later, you couldn't hear it on the radio anywhere. So they're free and equal blues. <laughs> I went down to the St. James Infirmary, yes, I did. And I saw some players with him. And I ups and asked the doctor man, was the donor dark or fair? What did he say? The doctor laughed, a great big laugh. He puffed it right in my face. He says, a molecule is a molecule, son, and the damn thing has no race. And that was news. Yes, there was news. That was very, very, very special news. Cause ever since that day, I've got those free and equal blues. You mean you heard that doc declare? I heard him, I heard him. A plasma in that test tube there could be white man, black man, yellow man, red. That's what he said. The doc puts down his doctor book and gives me a very scientific look. Speaks out plain and clear and rational. Metabolism is international. And that was news. And that was news. Yes, that was news. Yes, that was news. 
microscope with some Berlin blue blood. Oh, yeah. My gosh, it was the same as Chunking, Kribyshev, Chattanooga, Santa Barbara, Tinbuck, Two Blood. Why, them Aryans that thought they were noble, they didn't even know the corpuscle was global. <laughs> Trying to disunite us with the race of supremacy, fly in the face of old man chemistry, taking all the facts and trying to twist them, but you can't overthrow the circulatory system. And that was new. This is too interesting. I said to the doc, I said, give me some more of that scientific talk talk. He did, he said. Melt yourself down into a crucible, son. Pour yourself out into a test tube, and what have you got? 3,500 cubic feet of gas. The same for the upper and the lower class. Well, we'll let that pass. Carbon, 22 pounds, 10 ounces. You mean that goes for princes, dukes, and counts? Whatever you are, that's what the amount is. Carbon, 22, 22 pounds, 10 ounces. Iron, 57 grains. Not enough to keep a man in shape. Fifty ounces of phosphorus. Whether you're poor or prosperous, buddy, can you spare a match? Then you take twenty teaspoonfuls of sodium chloride. That's salt. Mixed with thirty-eight quarts of H2O. That's, that's water. water. Add sixty lumps of sugar. That's, that's, uh, that's sugar. Add two ounces of lime. A pinch of chloride of potash, a drop of magnesium, a bit of sulfur, a soup on a hydrochloric acid, and you stir it all up, and what are you? A walk-in drugstore. An international metabolistic cartel. And that was news. Yes, that was news. Oh, that was very, very, very special news. Ever since that day I've got those free and equal blue. So listen, you African and Indian and Mexican, Mongolian, Tyrolean and Tartar. The doctor is right behind the human rights charter. The doctor's Difference if you're Kelly, Kelly. you're Cohen, Cohen, if you're Lopez, Lopez. if you're Swenson, Jones, or Mendel. Every man, every woman, everywhere, right there, is the same. Now, as you probably surmised, that was not the way that Earl Robinson sang it in 1944 for the FDR salute on Election Eve. Earl Robinson recorded that at the age of 71. He had the habit of surrounding himself with young musicians, and he would bring the songs forward through time because he could still see their importance. He could still see their, their relevance today. Well, I guess you're getting the point. The long memory is the most radical idea in America. Well, what I'm talking about is New York City, uh, Mordor, as we call it out here in, in Nevada City. 
But when I left uh, Utah in 1969, when I actually had a blacklist of my own and had to go find a trade, where did I head? I, headed to, I went to New York City because that's where the Almanac Singers had started up. That's where the whole People's Song movement started. That's where Earl Robinson was composing, Yip Harburg was living. And that's where the, the nexus of the folk music revival, the commercial revival, was happening down in, in McDougal Street in Greenwich Village. So I uh, got into my old VW bus, Hitler's Revenge, kept eating transaxles all across the country, showed up in New York City, but I $8 short of having 20 cents, I mean so flat you could have played me on a Victrola, had a big box of Denver, Rio Grande, and Western Railroad spikes, which I sold to a nearsighted acupuncturist. I was going to take my meager amount of money and go down to, to Wall Street. You've heard of Wall Street. I was going to make some shrewd investments, par- parlay my small fortune into a major fortune, and then I was going to go back to Utah, buy the Mormon temple, and turn it into a Mexican restaurant. You can't have too many Mexican restaurants, and you can sure have too many Mormon temples. Well, I thought I made shrewd investments. I invested half of my money in, in uh, toilet paper, the other half in revolving doors, got wiped out before I could turn around. Hmm. Well, what am I doing here? How did I get from there out to Nevada City, California, up here in the mountain fastness of the western slope of the of the Sierra? Well, I tell you, playing there in New York once, was, uh, staying with some people, fortunately had an elevator because it was 36 stories, stories up in a, in a crumbling apartment building. I went to open the high to bed and uh, accidentally bumped the air conditioner in the window, and it plunged down 36 stories and landed on the leader of a teenage gang. That's why I'm here right now. Earl Robinson, during the late 1930s, the time that he was writing uh, much of his greatest music, belonged to the New York Songwriters Collective. I went there to try to track that down. That was people like Dr. Charles Seeger, who was Pete's father, uh, Bess Lomax, um, Earl Robinson, all writing under aliases, mainly classical, classically trained musicians it was from a European tradition who, who were, uh, in their spare time, getting together and composing the martial music that was going to be played when the workers finally took to the streets and began to build the workers' commonwealth. They didn't believe that there was an indigenous American music upon which you could build that kind of... They were, they were absolutely that ignorant. Uh, ignorant, uh, Aunt Molly Jackson, who wrote songs in the Kentucky Coal Wars, was exiled. I played, talked about her a week before last. Was exiled to New York City. Was invited to the Composers Collective, but she wasn't asked to sing. Why? She Because they said, quote, she was musically illiterate. Well, I have Aunt Molly Jackson uh, singing you know, right here. I have her... Recorded in um, 19, I guess it's 1934, uh, by Alan Lomax. Now, you listen to this, and you tell me if this woman was musically illiterate. Aunt Molly Jackson and Roll On Buddy. I've been a walking ten years on the hill and in railroad. I can't make enough money. For to pay my board I went to the boss I asked him for my time Oh, why do you think he told me I owed him one dime Oh, roll on, buddy and make a pure time I'm so weak and hungry I can't make mine I looked at the sun and the sun looked low I looked at my woman and she said don't go Oh, some of these days you look for me and I'll be gone back to take 
and I'll be gone on an old freight train. I looked at the sun, and the sun looked high. I looked at my woman, she began to cry. Oh, roll on, buddy. Don't roll so slow. I'm so weak and hungry. I can't work no more. That was composed by White Mountaineers, is that? Exactly. On the L and N Railroad. Years and years and years ago. You don't know when. Blind Kenny Hall doing our intermission music from Fresno, California. Kenny is so full of joy, been blind all of his life. He plays with great, he played all the bars, he played all the taverns. He learned an enormous amount of Mexican music that uh, you're listening to one of those right right there. He uses up old pot-bellied mandolin standing straight up on one knee and then plays it with the, uh, the back of a, a really long index fingernail. Well, I was talking about Woody a little while ago uh, at being part of the Almanac Singers. Yeah, Woody, at the behest of Ed Robbins out in Los Angeles, came east to New York City, and they all lived in this one apartment. Uh, Sis Cunningham had an Almanac house uh, with Pete Seeger and Lee Hayes. Now, if there is a beginning to the folk music revival, if there is a beginning to what you hear uh, Greg Brown and uh, and John Gorka doing and Darwin. If there's a beginning to all of that, or Tom Paxton or Bob Dylan, it was in that apartment on West 10th in New York City, you know, Almanac House. And well, Woody's a a hero of mine. Was Ammon Hennessy, the great Catholic anarchist, who said, "If you gotta have heroes, make sure they're dead so they can't blow it." That's just good advice. Well. I have largely despaired of heroes in these, the waning days of Babylon. How about you? You stop a kid on the street. Not a bad idea anyway. Don't know what they might be up to. Arrest thyself, young Syrah, and thy witless chorus. Yes, stop them, rattle them a little bit, and say, Hey, kid, who are your heroes? Chances are they're going to give you the name of somebody that doesn't exist. Um, Rambo or Romboid or whatever his name is. Uh, Luke Flypaper. I can't keep track of it. Uh, Barbie. Now tell me Barbie exists, poor deformed creature. My mother, who was an organizer for the CIO, made sure that my brother and I had appropriate heroes. She would, this was in Cleveland, Ohio, before we moved west in 47, she would clip columns out of the Cleveland Plain Dealer, good labor paper in its day, and she would paste those columns into scrapbooks that we could trundle off down to our local school to share with our wee comrades. She kind of favored stories about bank robbers. It was the late depression, there was a lot of that going on, and... Uh, we had one whole scrapbook full of the exploits of Willie Sutton. Remember Willie Sutton? Willie the actor Sutton used clever disguises to rob banks. He was good at it. Well, Willie Sutton was in jail by mistake, as all bank robbers are. A reporter interviewed him and said, Willie, why do you rob banks? He says, because that's where the money is. <laughs> we had one little scrapbook full of the exploits of Kid Farrow. He was a safe cracker in uh, Chicago. Harder to get info on this safe cracker from Chicago. Well, my parents passed away. I was out in the world banging around, and I had discovered that the great Studs Terkel 
had interviewed Kid Farrow in his dotage, and Studs was surprised to find out that this, this safecracker in Chicago had a political philosophy. He said, and I can quote it, Studs, I am committed to one proposition, taking money away from a bunch of dilettantes who earned it through nepotism. Take it away from them by hook, by crook, slingshot, canoe. You must shaft these guys. <sighs> well, I'm going to play a song by Woody Guthrie, one of my favorite Bank Robin songs about a, a prominent hero. Um, first off, though, right before that, I mean, and we'll go right into it, I want you to listen to Huey P. Long's speech to the congressional staff. He was a, when he was a senator, from the, he had been the governor of Louisiana, and then he was a senator from Louisiana. This is his speech in 1934. A year later, Huey Long was shot dead by the son of one of his political opponents, once again, my friends, the lone assassin. <laughs> Listen to this speech. See if you can figure out why. According to the tables which we have assembled, it is our estimate that 4% of the American people own 85% of the wealth of America and that over 70% of the people of America don't own enough to pay the debts that they owe. How many men ever went to a barbecue and would let one man take off the table what's intended for nine-tenths of the people to eat? The only way you'll ever be able to feed the balance of the people is to make that man come back and bring back some of that grub he ain't got no business with. Now, how are you going to feed the balance of the people? What's Morgan and Baruch and Rockefeller and Mellon going to do with all that grub? They can't eat it. They can't wear the clothes. They can't live in the house. But when they've got everything on the God's living earth that they can eat and they can wear and they can live in, and all that their children can live in and wear and eat and all their children's children can use, then we got to call Mr. Morgan and Mr. Mellon and Mr. Rockefeller back and say, come back here. Put that stuff back on this table here that you took away from here that you don't need. Leave something else for the American people to consume. We say to America, 125 million, none shall be too big, none shall be too poor, none shall work too much, none shall be idle. No luxurious mansions empty. None walking the streets. None impoverished. None in pestilence. None in want. But in the land blessed by the smile of the Creator, with everything to be consumed, to be eaten, to be worn, that America will become a land sharing the fruits of the land, not for the favored few. Not to satisfy greed, but that all may live in a land in which the Lord has provided an abundance sufficient for the luxury and convenience of the people in general. I think. If you'll gather round me, children, a story I will tell. A pretty boy, Floyd, an outlaw. Oklahoma knew him well. It was in the town of Shawnee It was Saturday afternoon His wife beside him in his wagon As into town they rode There a deputy sheriff approached him In a manner rather rude Using vulgar words of language And his wife she overheard Pretty boy grabbed the log chain And the deputy grabbed his gun And in the fight that followed He laid that deputy down There's a many a starving farmers The same old story told how this outlaw paid their mortgage And saved their little homes Others tell you of a 
a stranger that come to beg a meal and underneath his napkin left a thousand dollar bill it was in Oklahoma City it was on a Christmas day there come a whole car load of groceries with a letter that did say well you say that I'm an outlaw you say that I'm a thief Here's a Christmas dinner for the families on relief. Now as through this world I ramble, I see lots of funny men. Some will rob you with a six gun, some with a fountain pen. But as through your life you travel And as through your life you roam You will never see an outlaw Drive a family from their home Woody Guthrie. Yeah, and that was... Uh... Huey Long's speech, isn't that a wonderful, wonderful piece of work? And here he was screaming about the oil millionaire, Rockefeller, uh, Baruch Mellon, J.P. J. J.P. Morgan, as Rachel Lindsay used to put it, ranting against the, the bankers who have it all. Now, once again, uh, given the prevailing condition, given the kind of statistics you hear coming out, hopefully out of your community or public radio station, is this song from the past, is this song about today, huh? You tell me. All right. The Paint Creek Miner. The Paint Creek Miner was Ralph Chaplin. He was editing a small newspaper there in a uh, little town of Paint Creek in West Virginia. It was a small union paper. His, his organizing partner was named Rummy Rumball. Now, I heard this story while I was hitchhiking uh, down around Clay County through uh, West Virginia some years ago. Our organizing partner, partner was Rummy Rumball. Now, uh, Ralph had started to write a song, but he didn't finish it. Uh, the roof fell in, and Rummy Rumball had to jump the border to Mexico. The IWW was born. Ralph Chaplin joined it in 1913. He was up in Chicago at the headquarters of the Industrial Workers of the World, a union I belong to now for better than 40 years. And he got a letter from Rummy Rumball from Mexico. And it caught him up on the life and times and what was going on. And then at the end of that letter, as a footnote, just said, uh, by the way, Ralph, whatever happened to that song you were writing? Well, Ralph had forgotten about it. He uh, went through his trunk, got down to the bottom, found a bunch of old papers, and he took that out, lay down on the living room floor, and he finished that song, which is called uh, Solidarity Forever. And if there ever was a song that is the anthem of the American labor movement and known all over the world, it's Solidarity Forever. Now... I want to do something here. We have a way of, of uh, creating heroes, of idolizing people, of in many ways depriving them of, through their sheer heroism, through their sheer courage, of depriving them of their humanity, of their body parts and passions, as the Mormons would say. Uh, and I, and I, I don't like to do that. You know, ever since uh, Kate Wolfe made me really sit down and think about Big Bill Haywood and write that song called Nevada Jane, which is a, a softer idea. Now, here's Ralph Chaplin, 1918. The purgers are going. 500 wobblies as political prisoners are indicted here in the state of California alone. The office has been raided, shut down. Everything's been carried off in Chicago. The Chicago defendants are on trial for their lives. One of them is Ralph Chaplin. Well, they're all found guilty, of course, and being sent down to the federal penitentiary. Ralph Chaplin was in there in a tiny cell with the plaster walls sweating. He had no paper, he had no pen. He scrawled this poem on the wall with his fingernail in the plaster. There's an old tune from the last century that Jim Ringer taught me, so I put his poem to my little son to uh, that tune, and here is Ralph Chaplin's farewell to his little boy at the train station before they took him away to prison. Mm 
I cannot lose the thought of you. It haunts me like a little song. It blends with all I see or do. Every day, the whole day long, the train, the lights, the engines throb, and that one stinging memory. Your brave smile broken with a sob, and your face pressed close to me, lips trembling far too much to speak, the arms that would not come undone. The kiss so salty on my cheek, and now the long, long trip begun. I could not miss you more, it seemed. But now I don't know what to say. It's harder than I ever dreamed. Here, with you so far away, I cannot lose the thought of you. It haunts me like a little song. It blends. With all I see or do, every day, the whole day long, solidarity forever, solidarity forever. Through the workers' blood shall run. There can be no power greater anywhere beneath the sun. Yet what force on earth is weaker than the feeble strength of one? But the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Through the workers' blood shall run. There can be no power greater anywhere beneath the sun. Yet what force on earth is weaker than the feeble strength of one? But it's a union, yeah, the union makes us strong. They never toiled to earn, but without our brain and muscle, not a single wheel would turn. We can break their hearty power, gain our freedom when we learn that it's a union. Yeah, the union makes us strong.
long time ago to My Little Son by Ralph Chaplin. Then you had the Almanac Singers in 1940 singing Solidarity Forever. And then a young worker, um, uh, David Welsh, Dave Welsh, uh, made up this new tune for it because he's, he's, a, he's a rock and roller. And it's John Fromer singing it. You see how it all comes. The past didn't go anywhere. All right. Well, um, I'm going to just sing you a song here to go out on. Uh, we haven't done the upper crust any favors today. As you know, the upper crust, that's a handful of crumbs held together by a wad of dough. <laughs> so I'm going to sing to you. I have the rest of the day off. I'm going to go up to the community college campus and hang out with the students. We're walking around with their blank picket signs waiting for a sponsor. Maurice Sugar, the Ford Hunger March, I think it's 1934. I'm spending my night in a flop house. I'm spending my days on the street. I'm looking for work, but I find none. I wished I had something to eat. Oh, soup, soup. They gave me a bowl of soup. Soup, soup. They gave me a bowl of soup. You can all sing this gathered around your radios, you know, just like old time labor radio used to be when I was a kid. Try it out. Oh, soup, soup. They gave me a bowl of soup. Soup, soup. They gave me a bowl of soup. I worked 20 years in a factory. I did everything I was told. They said I was loyal and faithful. But now I am out in the cold. Oh, soup, soup. They gave me a bowl of soup. Soup, soup. They gave me a bowl of soup. There was an old fella up here in the Sierra, up by Downeyville. He used to haul dynamite on a mule back into his little hidden mining claim. One of those sudden storms boiled up over the Sierra. That Mule was lightning struck. Forty sticks of dynamite went off at the same time. Blew a hole in the ground 40 feet deep. And all they found in that hole was that fellow's hat and that mule's behind. But this plastic surgery is a wonderful thing, folks. Plastic surgeons gathered up what was left, worked on it for a couple of years. And today, that man is the governor of the state of California. <laughs> I shouldn't make fun of Governor Wilson. The man doesn't know the meaning of the word defeat. That's only one of hundreds of words he doesn't know the meaning of. I saved 15 bucks with my banker to buy me a car and a yacht. I went down to draw out my fortune. Hey, this is the answer I got. You guessed it. Soup, soup. They gave me a bowl of soup. Soup, soup. They gave me a bowl of soup. Yeah, how would you describe him? Like the old farmer said, numb as a hen. <laughs> Politicians, mo most of them so crooked they gotta screw their socks on in the morning. Well, time for me to get out of here. This has been Loafer's Glory, the Hobo Jungle of the Mind, and I hope I've made my point sufficiently and you understand completely what I'm up to. There are holes in our people's history you could drive a tank through, and very often they do. I'm just trying to plug some of the holes, okay? See you later and tap it light. When I die and I get up to heaven, St. Peter will let me ride in. They can tell by the soup I was fed on. I was unable to sin. Oh, soup, soup. They gave me a bowl of soup. Soup, soup. They gave me a bowl of soup. From Walt Whitman, a locomotive in winter. Fierce-throated beauty, roll through my camp with all thy lawless music, thy swinging lamps at night, thy madly whistled laughter echoing, rumbling like an earthquake, rousing all law of thyself complete, thine own track firmly holding, 
No sweetness debonair of tearful harp or glib piano thine. Thy thrills of shrieks by rocks and hills returned, launched o'er the prairies, wide across the lakes, to the free skies, unpent, glad, and strong. Mm -hmm.